Hi, everyone. <clears throat> if you could um, take it off the slides for a minute. I'll just uh, talk about some course logistics. Um, we are still troubleshooting our process here. Bear with us while we do so. Um, course logistics. One, for one thing, I'm going to be arriving in, at the last minute for the lectures um, this month. My kids just started school, and one of the schools doesn't even open until 7.45. So I'm there, my wife's at work earlier and then I'm hu than I am, and then I'm hustling over here. So I will try to be here um, on time and to start at 8.10, uh, but please realize I'm, I'm running across campus to do so, so I might be a couple minutes late. Office hours are as listed on the website every day after lecture um, for one hour in 3095 VLSB on Monday and Friday and 3059 VLSB on Wednesdays. So that's the place to go over questions from the lectures, course material from the books, um, and we can also set up office hours by appointment for anyone who has class time during those, uh, those slots. Uh, I put on, on BSpace just a folder where I'm going to occasionally add news links for interesting things in ecology and the news. It's on BSpace in the resources folder. I put something in there yesterday regarding a mountain lion that was um, seen and then shot uh, at Shattuck and Cedar. Um, in North Berkeley here. Um, <laughs> yeah, the... <laughs> don't panic, don't panic, it's dead. Um, they did shoot it, they were, the police shot it. Um, they had to make that decision, they gave it some time, it jumped a few fences, hid in people's yards. Um, it was a 100 pound female lion. Um, that's very unusual. They are in the hills, they are in in the local areas. They will more and more be encroaching in suburban areas and cities. Uh, it is to be predicted over the next years. But to get one, I mean, I look, I look for them. I look for their sign. Um, and it's very rare to see them even just in Tilden on the edges. Um, to get one all the way in town is pretty remarkable. Um, yeah. So n they won't always be ex as exciting as that, these types of reports. but. Uh, Things from the Times or things from uh, around the world regarding biology, you can just look at there, not to be examined on just for fun. Any um, thing about course logistics that you have questions on or um, anything about the presentations that's, that isn't working for you that you need to troubleshoot or that you would like to give advice on, just send me email. And um, I've been able to respond thus far. I haven't been inundated yet, so uh, I should be able to respond to you if, you if anything comes up. Okay, today we are talking about, um, we're getting into population ecology, demography and life history. Really, today and tomorrow we'll be talking about population ecology. given myself a giant cursor here so that people in adjoining rooms in the adjoining rooms can see it because they can't see my laser pointer so I'll try to put my laser pointer down and use this as much as possible um, so we'll be starting with uh, just a general look at population structure and the factors influencing population numbers numbers of individuals and populations we will look at mechanisms, methods to estimate population size, the phenomenon of dispersion within populations, briefly talk about metapopulation dynamics, the metapopulation concept, and then we will focus on life tables, life history tables and survivorship curves, and a bit on um, life history trade-offs, and that'll be our segue into discussions tomorrow. Here's, here are a bunch of sparrows to represent a population there in the middle of the figure. Um, we are taking a snapshot approach to populations. Nature is highly dynamic, of course. Nature is in continuous flux, right? 
Um, but very often we need to stand nature still to observe it and to quantify what we see. And um, we do this very often when estimating population numbers. We assume um, a lack of change in, uh, in the population with regard to the major forces that influence population numbers. What forces do influence population numbers? Here we have our, our little collection of sparrows, this interbreeding group of individual sparrows, indivi individual sparrows that have the potential to uh, interbreed with one another and thus share genetic material. Another name for a little group like that is a deme, D-E-M-E, -E, and that gives us the basis for our word demography. So this little deme is comprised of individuals and um, the numbers are influenced by four major forces. They, the numbers may increase as a result of births or the arrival of new individuals through immigration and the numbers may be reduced by death or the departure of individuals through emigration. Right? So birth and immigration add individuals to the population, death and emigration subtract individuals from the population. Those are dynamic processes. Those happen over time. Um, but for simplicity, we're often forced to uh, freeze the population in if we want to make estimates of numbers in the population. So let's look at how that is done in the field. Um, absolute density, so measurements of absolute numbers of individuals attempting to estimate actually exactly, you know, well, not, not exactly, it's always done with error, but to estimate absolute numbers of individuals in a population. Imagine your eucalyptus grove right outside the building here. If you wanted to count the number of trees, it wouldn't be too hard because they stand still for you. You could, um, you could mark them as you go to make sure you don't count them twice, but if you're careful and patient enough and there are few enough distractions, uh, you could count every individual and be very accurate about it. They're sedentary organisms, these eucalyptus trees. It helps a lot when counting. For motile, mobile animals um, and organisms, um, it's somewhat more of a challenge, but you might imagine for some large animals like um, ungulates on the top there, those are ibex, I believe, um, in North Africa, you could fly your plane overhead if the if the deem is small enough and count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, you, you get the idea. And be fairly accurate, especially if you're on an open grassland and the group is that small. Bunch of elephants, uh, if you're on the ground, uh, you might be surprised how hard it is to track and count them. But again, um, you might be able to be fairly accurate. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine from Southern California has been studying peccaries, which are like a, like a forest pig in Central America, in the rainforest in Central America. They've been using paintball guns to uh, <laughs> pop the pigs. Uh, they're big animals and they can take it. Um, but then you get a nice splatter of blue paint or whatever it is, and you know that you've counted it. And uh, it'll stay for a couple of days and they're having a great time. <laughs> so those are methods to get uh, counts of absolute numbers of individuals in populations. Very often, you can't count everyone because there are too many or t because the area is too large. And you use a sampling method. Um, very commonly used uh, methods include quadrat the use of quadrats to lay an, a, a grid of known area over a surface and to count the individuals observed in that grid and then to extrapolate to a larger area um, from what's estimated within that local area, or to run a transect, for example, on the coral reef here, to run a transect and um, to monitor the number of individuals touched along that transect and to extrapolate mathematically from there to an area. These methods depend on certain assumptions, and um, we'll look into a few of them as we go. These techniques are great, again, for, um, they tend to be best for sedentary, for animals that stay stationary. 
animals like this, fish or uh, large vertebrates, tend not to. So one of the uh, tried and true methods for dealing with organisms, particularly larger organisms that move around, is to, um, is to catch them um, or to somehow mark them and then to resurvey the population later. And I'll just give you the very basic math behind the technique. So on the top, we have a population of individuals, unsur unsurveyed, OK? Um, and we, s we perform a, a survey. We, we take a sample of the individuals in that population from that region of the space occupied by the population. And we capture that many individuals. It looks like it's 12 individuals. And we mark them somehow. Um, you might, if it's a snail, you might put a little nail polish on its shell. Um, if it's a, a rodent, you might um, clip a little bit of its ear that won't grow back. And so you know it has a, when you catch it again, that it has a little notch in its ear that you made. Um, or if it's a bird, you might put a band around its leg or something like that. You sample it somehow, and then you release those individuals back to the population. Those individuals become reincorporated in the population and um, mix with the original population. Then you sample the population again, ideally at a relatively short interval, after a relatively short interval of time, as close to um, the time after everyone has mixed back together again as possible. And you take your second sample and say in this case you catch um, 15 organisms and you find that four of them have tags. So let's see what we can do with that information. Because what we want to estimate is the total size of the population, of the original population, that we didn't have the luxury of sampling in toto because either the area is too large or the individuals were invisible. Usually it's resource limited. You just can't, um, you just can't do it, uh, either for the finances or because it takes too long or the space is too great. But there's a nice way to estimate the number from what we've just done in our surveys. We're interested in total population size, estimating that. That's capital N for number of individuals. The simple equation we can use is based on the fact that in our recapture, the proportion of individuals recaptured with marks to the number recaptured should be equal to the ratio of the original number of marked individuals to capital N, to that total population size. And if you spend a couple minutes with that, you'll, you'll see why that, that's the case. Why m over n equals x over n in this equation. And if, since we're interested in total population size, capital N, we can just solve that equation for n and use those variables, m, the marked individuals from the first sample, the number of marked individuals from the first sample, times the total caught in the second sample, divided by the number of marked individuals recaptured in that second sample. So there's our, there's our simple equation to do so. Returning to our example, we marked 12 individuals. So m equals 12. We released them back into the population and then resurveyed, recall. And in that process, we captured 15 individuals in total. Only four of them were marked. And so then if you just simply plug those numbers into your equation, you can solve for, you can, you can generate an estimate of the total population size, 45. That's always done with some error, right? And I think if you count them up, there are 41 individuals there. So we got pretty close, close enough for government work, as they say, and the, uh, the work goes on. But what are, if this is going to work, what are some of the assumptions um, that you must make? 
Anyone have any ideas on that? If you're going to get an accurate estimate here, what's an assumption you might have to make? Yeah. And how might population size change between sampling? You could have deaths. Yes. That might change. So you assume that there's no mortality um, between your sampling intervals. What else? Yes. Yes. You have to assume that the individuals reintegrate into the original population. And they don't just um, hang out in one corner of the sampling area that you might miss entirely if you visit the other corner. You need to assume um, reintegration. What else? Anyone, can anyone think of anything else? Yes. No immigration or emigration which is r similar to what someone else said about death, because those are the, uh, among the other factors that might influence numbers that aren't related to um, what you're trying to estimate here. Yes. Yes, perfect. You have an equal chance of catching the ones that were marked versus the ones that were not marked. And in other words, you don't have animals that are capture shy or capture happy. We, uh, mammologists actually speak of trap happiness because some organisms just seem to get back into the trap again and again and again. Um, and then, you know, in a case, for example, with rodents, um, where you set up a trap and it's got oats and peanut butter and a little cotton inside, uh, it's a rather luxurious hotel for the night for some of them, I guess, uh, because they have it spend one night in there, eat well, are released, and back they go. There may be even a genetic basis for something like that. Whatever it is, some organisms do avoid, the, avoid such capture, and some of them seem to be attracted to it. Um, and that biases your sampling. Those are great suggestions. There may be other assumptions that go into this. Thinking about density, um, just be aware that um, you're going to need to use different techniques for different organisms, in part because organisms come in different sizes. And the sizes of the organism, the size of the organism, is related to their density. You're not going to sample bacteria in the same way that you're going to sample birds and mammals. This is just a birds and mammals example, sticking with our theme of using them um, quite a lot. And something to recognize here is that as body weight increases, the density of the population decreases for both birds and mammals. But that the slope of this line, the slope of this regression, is lower for the birds than it is for mammals. So at a particular body weight, say 10 kilos, the average number of individuals of birds in a unit area is going to be lower than the average number um, of mammals in that area. Okay, So those are just a couple of things to bear in mind about creatures. We'll build on that insight as we go and the relationship of body size to, um, to life history and biology. Body size is critically important to most life history parameters, including uh, well, it's also related to uh, density. Those were, we were just looking at absolute ways to estimate density, to generate, you know, an actual number. Even if it's, a, even if it's an estimate, like we got from our mark recapture survey, it's still, we're producing an, an absolute number in the end. But you might just be okay with a relative estimate of, um, of density. And to do that, you might study the sign of, of an organism. You might compare two, um, two sandy areas and count the trackways along those sandy areas. And if one area has um, a dozen sets of trackways, maybe you can even distinguish individuals. So you know you have 12 distinct individuals on this surface. And in another site, 
um, in the same interval of time, holding all other factors as constant as possible, you find many fewer. You might be able to say this sandy area is uh, more dense in, what in this organism than the other, right? And that might be sufficient. If, you're inter if it's a conservation motivation and you need to figure out quickly where more individuals are, if you're going to put up a house on this beach versus that beach, something like that, you might get away with a technique like this. Or you could count um, what are sometimes called artifacts. Um, these are chimneys produced by crayfish burrowing underground. Um, you could survey a surface and count chimneys. And that if, you, uh, if they're one-to-one -one or um, proportional to the number of individuals present, the counting chimneys is almost as good as counting animals. Or you can um, do scat surveys. Um, so all, these are, all these are forms of sign, or, or um, as you sometimes hear in the old world, spore. S-P-O-O-R uh, is just a, uh, another term for the sign of an organism, whether it's a trackway or a, um, fecal droppings or artifacts like that. This help you with relative estimates of density. If we're interested in tracking the movement of organisms in relation to immigration or emigration, say, um, classic methods uh, include putting radio collars on. And I just um, searched on radio collars and found a bunch of fun images. Um, you know, these things are often big and bulky. They have a big battery inside. And then you walk around with a unit and the uh, signal is sent to your unit indicating to you the direction, um, the position of the organism with the collar. They're, um, they can be a bit clumsy because the bigger the battery, the longer lived the radio collar, but the heavier for the carrier. And that's a point we could have made in our, um, in our assumptions about mark recapture methods. These, these can threaten the life of the organism. Not only the, um, the collar, but the capture process. If you anesthetize this big bear, that's a risk to, the, to its health, of course. You're taking that risk in order to learn something about the population and um, hopefully bring a better understanding and, um, for conservation. Um, but a risk it is. And in the mark recapture method, you, ha you need to assume that mortality is not increased for the individuals you tag. But if you catch a fish and keep it out of water and then tag it, uh, it may very well increase the likelihood of its mortality. So radio collars, uh, the bigger the better because the longer they last, but uh, they can often be very clumsy on the creature. So there's a, there's a wolf fitted with a collar, just to give you some ideas of what people are doing in the field. Everyone loves the dwarf bunny. Uh, an endangered species of dwarf bunny. Um, <laughs> that's my favorite. I like aardvarks. Uh, aardvark with a radio collar. And these are burrowing animals. These are animals living underground, and that's a huge leather collar. So that's really cumbersome and uh, probably slows it down in relation to the hyenas and all the rest. But if you want to know how far the aardvarks are moving at night, you really don't have much other choice because you can't, as big as it is, you can't follow an aardvark for very long on foot without a collar. <laughs> Everyone knows meerkats now, right? They've, been, they've become quite famous. Or Tasmanian devil. And you can get very small with them, you know, a harvest mouse or something like that, a um, little collar on those. Uh, one of the things I study in Africa are, are land snails, giant land snails. And during the summer, they, during the dry and warm season, they, they go underground. They disappear. And I would love to put a radio collar on these snails and follow them. It would just be fascinating. Um, but you really need to be on the ground, and you need to invest and put the resources in. Uh, yeah, you get the idea. Something else that's frequently used to monitor movement are pit tags, passive integrated transponder units. Uh, these, these do not have a battery in them, so they can last much longer, and they're very tiny. So they can be even injected with a syringe under the skin of an organism. Um, and you might, you know, uh, they can be used for pets because they, they're provided with a certain amount of information in whatever kind of chip it is they contain. And then when stimulated by a reader, by a scanner, they'll, 
they'll provide that information back. So if you catch a, if you catch a turtle on a beach, you could enter the information the day on which it's caught, um, the time and the location, and put the pit tag in, and years later, scan a turtle that washes ashore, and if it has a pit tag in it, retrieve that information and get to know something about its pattern of movement, dispersal. You can do it with fish. You can put it under the skin of a frog. Um, very handy. Let's think about the way individuals are dispersed within a population. Um, and that's one slide. If someone from one of the adjoining rooms could tell me later if they're seeing the edge on it, then I'll know better um, what's fitting over there. Yeah, so individuals in a population, how are they, how are they separated around units of space? We'll distinguish three types of dispersion. Uniform dispersion, those rep dots representing the individuals, with relative, you know, with approximately equal amount of space between individuals. Or a more random configuration, or a clumped, or patchy. I'll probably use the word patchy more often. I think your book uses clumped. Um, a patchy configuration. Which of these do you think is most common for organisms? I heard a lot of clumped out there. Yeah, um, it, by far. But let's look at some of the, um, the forces that generate these different patterns. Um, and I, I would want you to go back and think about our sampling techniques and how the sampling techniques um, might depend on some of these uh, dispersion patterns. So patchy distribution, clumped distribution on the intertidal, that space between high and low tides on a coastal shelf, um, where in this case you have a bunch of starfishes and, and mussels and barnacles and some algae distributed clump clumpily. Why might they be distributed in clumps here, in this case? Yes? Food resources. Maybe there, that's where they can find things to eat. In the case of the starfish, these are mobile. And so they can move around and seek their food resources. But these other creatures are much less mobile. Um, so it still might apply. Uh, but it might apply s most particularly, in this case, to, um, to the starfish. What else? Yes? Protection from predators. Maybe it's a sh more sheltered spot and to avoid predators. How about something else? Yes? The water. The water. What about the water? Some places that have water at low tide. So the first two, um, food and predators, those would be biotic factors, right? Influencing dispersion patterns here. Patterns here. The example of how water might influence it, we could add um, exposure to air and sunlight at low tide as abiotic factors that might influence the distribution, non-living factors, factors of the physical environment. And that's often um, a major structural aspect of these intertidal communities, exposure um, to desiccation, to drying out. And organisms distribute themselves, in many cases, spatially as a result of um, physical factors. Uniform distribution in these penguins. I'll give you another example of that in a second. Random distribution in these uh, dandelions, I think they are, where the entire area is suitable habitat. Um, and where the seeds land, where they're blown to and happen to land and germinate and establish, is basically random, all sites being more or less equal in suitability for growth, giving you this kind of random pattern. And that's what's just so often not the case. The environment is not homogenous like this, allowing suitability of growth across space in a uniform manner. 
I used the word uniform there. I really shouldn't have because um, I want to use the word uniform more specifically. So these are, um, these are like the penguins. Uh, these are gannets. Uh, these are breed a breeding population of gannets. And if you look at their nests, um, look how they're distributed. What kind of dispersion is this? Uniform. They're more or less equally separated. The distance of separation is related to what? Territories. Really how long their neck and bill can reach before they peck at the other one, right? You need to be just far enough away that you won't be harassed by your neighbor. And that gives the individual bird enough space to um, feel comfortable in raising its chicks. So that kind of um, inter-individual interaction pr produces the spacing um, that leads to the uniform pattern. I have a little audio. If you go into um, the Berkeley Hills, uh, if you're not scared of the mountain lions, um, and let me just say right now, uh, mountain lion attacks, you're more likely to hit, be hit by falling airplane debris, right, if you walk in the hills, than you are to even encounter a mountain lion, probably. Um, they are really not, not a risk around here. So um, please do go into the hills, uh, up, to, uh, um, up to Lake Anza and Jewel Lake and the Wildcat Watershed. It's just over the hill here. And if you go up there, you might hear, um, you might hear that. If you're fortunate and you spend enough time there, it would be um, the call of a, of a kingfisher. And that's very often a territorial call. It's alerting the other birds in the area that it is present, and other birds would know to stay away from its turf. And through mechanisms like that, um, or otherwise territorially marking your habitat, um, often with um, scent markings, urine or feces. Um, many animals will spray, that, uh, spray it into a higher spot, and then the other animals will come around, sniffing around, and know who is where. And territories will be established th in this way. Maybe the, ter the perimeters of the territories will be marked in this way, and it may produce a uh, uniform distribution of individuals. How about these, uh, these semi-arid plants here? Um, they are relatively evenly spaced about this surface. Why? They're not urinating on each other, right? Um, they're not calling out to each other and sep or pecking each other. So why might they be uniformly distributed? You guys have been great with your answers, yeah. Resources, what do you mean? The amount of, re the amount of uh, nutrients or water that they can take from the earth in that area. Can someone build on that? Yes. Excuse the root systems. What about the root systems? Yeah, perhaps the roots need a certain amount of space and they become intertangled. Yeah, I, th I think you could build on that a little further and think that maybe these root systems and these plants require a certain amount of resources that they take up from that space. And if it's, say, water and nutrients that are limited, it just might not allow for growth of other individuals in close proximity. So once they become established and start dominating that resource acquisition in that spot, others can't grow there. Maybe that's what you two are hinting at. Um, and that is one possibility. What's another possibility? It's kind of technical. If you, you might need to know something about plants to know what might be happening here, and it often does. Plants are very good at this. Yeah. yeah. They can release chemicals that prevent germination or that kill other neighbors. Um, I think I added the term here. Yeah, allelopathy, or allelochemicals um, is just the name for that. You'll learn more about that in botany. But that can also give rise to uniform distribution. Fungi on a tree trunk. What kind of dispersion pattern? Yeah, you're good to hesitate. Um, for one thing, it can be just hard to assess the fine details of what's happening here. But I include this and I include the next slide because I want you to think about scale. On that 
chunk itself, that might be uniform or random. I don't know. You'd have to, uh, you'd have to quantify it. But think about the forest as a whole. There are only going to be a limited number of dead logs. And at the level of the forest as a whole, it's almost certainly going to be patchy, the growth of these fungi. Think about a landscape like this and think about lichen. Maybe you know what lichen is, right? It's actually a symbiosis of fungi and algae. We'll learn about that later. Um, but lichen grows on surfaces like rock surfaces or the trunks of trees. Think about the distribution of lichen on this landscape and its dispersion pattern. And try to move across spatial scales. In ecology, we move across levels of organization quite nimbly. And you need to be able to move across spatial scales nimbly as well. Um, ecologists are doing that all the time. They're very flexible in that. And so try to, um, try to think about things at different spatial scales as much as possible. I want to introduce the concept of a metapopulation. There's a definition for you. And I'll present this concept of a metapopulation um, as, as an approach, really as an approach to the study of populations. It's not a distinct level of organization or something like that. It's an approach to the study of population. The, con the, the concept can be defined as a group of spatially separated populations that interact through immigration and emigration. Most organisms are distributed patchily like this, in patches of suitable habitat. But note that some areas of suitable habitat remain unoccupied. They are perfectly livable, but they're just not occupied because the individuals there have gone extinct in that local spot, or for historical reasons, it, individuals just haven't arrived for whatever reason. But over time, that changes. Individuals arrive into these patches from previously existing individuals in other patches, and individuals in some patches will go locally extinct and become unoccupied. So ecologists study this dynamic process. Um, and there are, it's a particular subdiscipline within ecology. Journals dedicated to it. And it's very much amenable to mathematical modeling. And it's a rich field of study. Um, great example given in your book from these butterflies in Finland, where the investigators surveyed, and you can see the, the distance here is five kilometers, so over a very wide area, surveyed the number of available patches of habitat represented by the empty circles and the number of occupied patches represented by the filled circles and followed this over time as these patches blinked in and out with occupation and local extinction and modeled that dynamic. That's a study of metapopulation dynamics. Let's move into demography in our last um, 10 minutes here. Um, demography was largely developed um, in the study of humans, human demography. Uh, it's, but it's extremely important for ecologists we as well, and major contributions have been made by ecologists. It's been a nice uh, cross-fertilization of human biology and uh, non-human biology over the years. And there's just a reminder of our term DEEM. Um, which is sometimes useful um, to distinguish it from a, a larger population. Those are, um, I don't intend to have audio for this, so yeah. Those are Belding's ground squirrels up in the Sierras. Um, I was up there last week with my family up in Tuolumne Meadows, and we got to see and hear these little guys. Um, great study given in your book um, on this species of ground squirrel. Um, don't be too distracted by the film. Let's look at the uh, columns here. <laughs> they are awfully cute. Um, a life table is a table structured according to cohorts, individuals of the same age, um, most thoroughly studied when you follow a, cer a certain number of individuals at the start of a time period of a certain age and follow those individuals across years um, according to their survival. 
So these are, this, is, this is really a uh, study of, I should just stop it, eh? <laughs> should either just show it separately or stop it. Um, yeah, here comes the kitty cat and the squirrel, yeah. <laughs> okay, stop. The squirrel survives. <laughs> just as you will in the hills when you make your next trip. All right. Um, the proportion alive at the start of the year. If you know how many are alive at the start of each year, you can calculate the proportion of them that have made it to the following year. Um, of course, the cats and the hawks and things are going to be, and the very, very cold winters at 10,000 feet are going to be killing these things. Um, a certain number of deaths will occur each year, and you can calculate the death rate from this data. From any one column, you can, you can generate the other uh, column's information. Note that the life history data for females is different than it is for males. That's often the case for mammals and birds um, and humans. Um, such that when you plot a survivorship curve, um, note that we're on a logarithmic scale here, and if you're not remembering an, the difference between an arithmetic scale and a logarithmic scale, you can discuss it um, in section. Um, note that the curve is different for the males than for the females. The females tend to survive longer, a greater number of years, and uh, mortality um, rates are higher for the males given the steepness of that, of that curve, okay? I want to fit uh, the rest of this in, so we'll just carry forward. Uh, the, book, the book does quite well on this subject, and uh, you'll learn a lot more in your labs and discussions. But let's think about other creatures, right? Let's not um, think about m just mammals or humans. Think about a, a giant clam releasing millions of eggs, unlike the squirrel, which would just be producing a small litter millions of eggs produced. They can't all survive. That's a really big clam. And even though the Great Barrier Reef is really, really big also, you can't fit that many clams um, with each one producing all those eggs and having them all survive. Massive mortality is going to occur in this process. And you know, this is one of the, w one of the ways in which it's going to be, it would be great to be building on the evolution section. Because uh, so many Darwinian insights come from uh, insights into this phenomenon, this, this, the fecundity of creatures. Um, so organisms differ very, very much in this regard in, in their production of offspring. Um, for creatures that produce massive numbers of individuals for which mortality occurs dramatically in the very earliest stages, the survivorship curve might follow this type three configuration, represented here by an oyster, very much like what would happen with the clam. Huge numbers of eggs broadcast out into the open water, hoping that some small number will actually uh, establish and survive. Those few that do establish and get firmly situated tend to live a long time because they have a good space and they become too large to be dislodged. Uh, if you're a big oyster and a little egg lands and uh, becomes a small individual oyster, it's not going to be able to knock you off. Um, you're, you're just, you're too big for that. So once you're established, you tend to survive a long time. But mortality is massive in the earliest stage. The squirrels, they tend to have a likelihood of survival across time that doesn't, the rate of, of death doesn't change much over time. If the start of the season there are 50 squirrels, maybe half of them will survive to the next year. And then the following year, well, half of those are going to survive. No matter whether you're two years old or four years old, your chance of survival across the year is maybe 50%. Because once you get to a certain age, um, you're, you're equally likely to get nailed or to die of freezing as you are at uh, twice that age. Humans and many large mammals follow a different pattern where um, although there is higher mortality in the very earliest stage of life, um, during birth, immediately after birth, perinatal. Um, once established, the, end of the likelihood of survival is quite good until a certain period of senescence, after which the likelihood of survival becomes quite less good. 
And um, one of the reasons why human demographers were so important in the development of these fields is this is important for life insurance companies, right? They need to know this schedule of death in order to, uh, in order to schedule um, the costs and returns of uh, insurance. So three types of uh, survivorship curve, so, and we c we'll call them types one, two, and three. That's traditionally the, the case. And some examples of these different curves um, showing the difference in females and males um, in Homo sapiens, ourselves, uh, types one, two, and three. The fact that many songbirds also follow a more or less type two configuration or a more type one configuration in a flowering plant. And reproductive tables, where those are real, the, the life tables are focused on, um, are focused on survival and death. Um, reproductive tables are more focused on the birth process and natality. We'll get into those more tomorrow um, when we look at population growth. Just a um, little introduction there. Hang with me for five more minutes, please. A few of you need to leave right now, I guess, but uh, I'm going to fill up the time here, so please hang with me. Um, Trade-offs in life history. We always need to be thinking about, uh, about trade-offs. Again, we're not building on the evolution section, but in general, it behooves an organism to leave as many off viable offspring as possible in a Darwinian context, in the context of natural selection. We increase our fitness by leaving as many viable offspring as possible and, in, and magnify our genetic contribution to subsequent populations by doing so. But you can't, if you're a kestrel, just produce a massive clutch of eggs. And the more eggs, the better. You can't perform that way. Um, for one thing, it's expensive to produce eggs. It takes energy to make them. And for another, um, who's going to feed the young? Well, you have to. And so you can't feed 30 young in your nest with the resources that are available in the local environment, given the constraints of rainstorms that are coming through and the competition from other individuals. There are many constraints acting on these creatures, energetic, competitive, biotic, and abiotic, that limit the capacity, their capacity to um, to reproduce. And so in this nice study taken from the book, it is an experimental manipula manipulation study where in investigators went in and actually reduced the number of eggs in the nests of males and females um, or enlarged the number of eggs in those nests or left them untouched and then followed the survivorship of those parents the following winter during the, the season of dearth, the difficult season where um, if, unless they have enough energy themselves, they won't make it through that season. And when the number of offspring were reduced, males and females had higher survival than normal in that subsequent year, showing the energetic cost of raising a brood of eggs and a brood of young. And for eggs that were added to the nest, for broods that were artificially enlarged, the parents, um, and maybe the males in particular, um, had difficulty surviving that following winter, having raised that many young or attempted to do so. Um, they depleted their own energy and weren't able to survive the following winter. So we've got to always think about the trade-offs in, um, in these processes. Finally, I'll just introduce you to a couple of new terms in um, terms of demographic traits. Because some organisms reproduce repeatedly throughout their lives. Humans do. Um, these scorpions do. They repeat, they, they reproduce, produce this, this brood of organisms, send them off on their way, and uh, in this case, perform some parental care, send them off, and then do it again the following year. But others will only reproduce once in their lives. And you can call this semel parity or big bang reproduction. They've, they put all of their resources um, and it may take decades into one massive reproductive bout. And I want you to think about um, why the conditions that might give rise to these different strategies. Famously, the salmon that run in the rivers in the Northwest. They spend their, their youngest portion of their lives swimming downriver, 
get big in the oceans and then migrate back upriver to spawn at the sites in which they were born. The males and females congregate at those spawning sites, those original spawning sites, having made it there past the sea lions and the fishermen and the grizzly bears. They finally make it, put everything into the, they're completely exhausted, put everything they have left into their reproductive effort, and then they die. Um, that's semel parity, okay? And uh, you can think about rhinos and coconuts as opposed to dandelions by looking at the slides. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>